Here we go. Uh, we'll have a chance at the end of this presentation to uh, vote on the object that means the most uh, to you. I am uh, here uh, with you tonight with my uh, curator uh, just below me, Jennifer Royer, because we won earlier uh, this year. So I had uh, the pleasure um, as uh, representing Landis is with Jen to um, hosting it uh, tonight. Um, if you want to make it three, uh, feel free, but we uh, want you to vote with uh, your, your heart and your emotions and your favorite sport, whatever one might uh, turn out. So um, before we get started, would like um, each of the panelists to introduce themselves. So on my Brady Bunch screen, um, starting to my left is the bearded gentleman with the bat. Please introduce yourself and let us know uh, the uh, museum you're from. Hi, I'm Josh Fox. I'm the curator at the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum. Great, thanks for joining us today, uh, Josh. And then to my uh, right is um, uh, John Fielding. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm John Fielding. I'm the curator at the Anthracite Heritage Museum and Eckley Miners Village. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, welcome, John. Um, and then going on to my bottom left, uh, Chris. Hi, my name is Chris O'Brien and I'm a visitor services guide at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. And then directly below me, uh, Jen. Hi, I'm Jennifer Roy. I'm the curator at Landis Valley Village and Farm Museum in Lancaster. And last but certainly not least, uh, Jen. Hi, I'm Jen Gleim. I'm the curator at the Pennsylvania Military Museum. Wonderful. Well, we appreciate um, all of uh, you joining us uh, tonight. We look forward to your uh, lovely um, objects and articles. And uh, what we'll be doing is giving each of our panelists approximately five minutes to present to all of you their um, object du jour via sports tonight. And then once everyone is presented, we will, um, I will activate the poll, you'll vote, and we'll know who um, comes away with the PHMC pennant at the um, end of the evening. So without further ado, we'll be going in alphabetical order, but this time uh, we'll be starting at the bottom of the alphabet. So we will start with the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum and Christopher. Thank you. And I was actually joking with my coworkers earlier that I did not want to go first today. I want to see what you all did, but uh, I guess that's karma. All right, so I just need to share my screen real quick. All right, let me get set up. All right, so I am going to be presenting on a baseball uniform that we have here in the collections at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania. And just to give a little context with this uniform and how it relates to the railroads, because this does kind of seem very odd that uh, baseballs and baseball and railroads would kind of go together. So just a little bit of context, you know, uh, Baseball kind of really gained popularity here in the United States in the 1850s and was extremely popular from the 1850s to the 1870s along with cricket. And while cricket would decline in popularity in the early 20th century, it would certainly gain, uh, I'm sorry, baseball would certainly gain popularity uh, throughout the 20th century and even today. Um, Baseball kind of got its 
start with the railroads in Altoona, as Altoona was a very crucial town for the Pennsylvania Railroad. It was the location of their shops, their maintenance facilities, rail yards, the horseshoe curve, and thousands of employees for the Pensy lived and worked in Altoona. As such, the Pennsylvania Railroad provided many amenities for their employees, including uh, creating the Altoona Cricket Club and constructing Cricket Field, which was used for many athletics, uh, such as equestrian, baseball, football, and of course, cricket. Uh, by the mid to late 1800s, many other railroads would begin to establish their own athletic associations, as well as baseball teams. And these would be intercompany leagues for the most part that were created with teams formed from employees of typically the same department. So you would have teams of the shop workers, uh, teams of the maintenance uh, guys, teams of the office staff and so on and so forth. And they would typically wear their, their own uniforms and they were usually handmade. They were made out of wool and had simple hand cut and hand sewn uh, felt logos on them. They would play one another in intercompany leagues as well as other local clubs and colleges. Uh, they would actually keep records of their uh, schedules, standing, stats, and photos, highlights, and all that kind of stuff. And they would actually uh, play in like a playoff at the very end of the of their season, where they would then play in a championship game, depending on who had the best standings at at the end of the year. Now, baseball uniforms on the railroads were pretty uh, simple. They were pretty simple and really did not have a whole lot of flair to them. Uh, these are just a couple examples of baseball uniforms for different railroads that we have uh, photos of in our collection. So the one on my left is a baseball team around 1916 from the Meadows shop in New Jersey. And on my right is a baseball team around 1905 from the Babcock Lumber. Um, lumber Railroad. And as you can see, they're very simple, very plain, not all that complex, not all that fancy. And that is kind of similar to what our baseball uniform looks like. And that is this piece right here. Uh, so we actually have the full thing. We have not only the jersey, but also the uh, pants to go along with it. We believe that the jersey and the pants were constructed in the early 20th century. They were made out of wool by uh, Marshall E. Smith and brother out of Philadelphia. They have hand cut and hand sewn on logos on the breast and on the sleeve of the, of the jersey. And these logos from Top to bottom here are PRR for the Pennsylvania Railroad, MD for the Maryland Division of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And then on the sleeve, you can't see it because uh, I didn't, I didn't really photograph it, but you can't really see it. But the uh, logo on the sleeve is a keystone that has the letters LAA in it, which stands for the Lamokin Athletics Association, the athletic association that this employee would have played for, uh, played baseball for. Like I said, the, the pants are not shown in the photo, but they do match the jersey in color and material. And we believe that this employee was probably an avid slider uh, because on the back of the, of the pants, you can see a, a lot of holes that were mended and sewn up throughout the year. So we believe he was a pretty avid slider uh, when he was playing for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, now, in addition to that, I just want to quickly point out that the railroads actually had a somewhat of, a, of an influence on baseball. And along with the cricket field being constructed in Altoona in 1878, the Pennsylvania Railroad also constructed Penmar Park in Philadelphia. And both of these fields would actually be played by 
uh, would actually be played by a couple of professional baseball teams at the time. In 1934 to 1949, the Pensy leased Penmar Park to Eddie Gottlieb, the co-owner of the Philadelphia Stars. And in the 30s, the Homestead Grays played their home games at Cricket Field. Uh, now, these were two teams in the uh, Negro League baseball and played at parks constructed by, by the railroads, uh, which is actually kind of cool. And the other thing I wanted to point out, um, oops, going too far, but the Homestead Grays would actually play against a Pennsylvania Railroad team in 1930, who they beat six to three. So I wanted to share that along with the uniform that we have. And uh, even today, the railroads still have a little bit of influence on baseball with names, uniform logos, color schemes, and even mascots uh, taking inspiration from the railroads, uh, such as the Reading Phillies, the Altoona Curve, and the Wilkes-Barre, Scranton Wilkes-Barre Rail Riders, all taking a little bit of inspiration from the railroads. And that pretty much wraps up my presentation on our uh, jersey. And one last note I quickly want to throw in there because I just learned this about a week or two ago, but apparently my great grandfather on my dad's side, the O'Brien side of the family, uh, actually played baseball for one of the railroads that he worked on. So I just wanted to share that as well. Fabulous. Wow. What a wonderful personal uh, connection. Thank you, uh, Christopher. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so from Pennsylvania, uh, Ray, from the Pennsylvania Railroad Museum, uh, we have the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad Maryland Division uh, baseball jersey. So um, we next uh, switch gears to uh, Jennifer Gleim and the Pennsylvania uh, Military Museum. Jennifer. Hi. Hi. Let's see. Good evening. So I'm going to talk about sports during wartime. Let's see if I can get. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the Inter-Allied Games. Uh, the Inter-Allied Games were held June 22nd. 20, or 1919 to July 6, 1919, in a hastily constructed stadium outside Paris, France, called Pershing Stadium. The Inter-Allied Games were developed uh, by the U.S. military in cooperation with the YMCA as a means of entertaining American soldiers who were uh, essentially stuck in France at the end of World War One. Believe it or not, the war actually ended a lot faster than the United States thought it would. And uh, between the abrupt ending and the 1918 influenza pandemic, the US wasn't prepared to bring home thousands of soldiers. So they were stuck in debarkation camps along the coast of France, mostly with nothing to do and were causing all sorts of problems. So they developed this program of games that lasted 15 days and welcomed military athletes from the United States, Great Britain, and 11 other allied nations. More than 1,500 men competed at the stadium that seated 20,000, and events included baseball, wrestling, golf, fencing, boxing, rowing, shooting, and track and field. Um, they also had some uh, Mass games, which were designed solely for amusement, and they included relay races, chicken fights, arm wrestling, and leapfrog. Um, one, uh, one event that probably you would never hear outside of a military games were uh, hand grenade tossing. Um, soldiers from all nations had become very familiar with using hand grenades and nearly two and a half percent of all the casualties during World War I resulted from hand grenade injuries. Former American baseball player F.C. Thompson achieved victory for the United States when he tossed a hand grenade 246 feet. So uh, that was a particularly interesting event. 
And the ribbon that you see here came from the Inter-Allied Games and belonged to Lieutenant Taliesin Waters of Nanakoke, Pennsylvania. Uh, Taliesin served in the 28th Division, 107th Field Artillery during the war and was awarded a Distinguished Service Cross for aiding wounded soldiers under a uh, gas attack. He carried 36 men to safety after he dressed their wounds. Um, and during the Inter-Allied Games, he served as a medical technician and was given this ribbon. Uh, the, the games enjoyed great popularity throughout the world. Newspapers covered them and uh, for the first time actually exposed American or exposed international audiences to the American sports of baseball and basketball. So for those two weeks, news reports for once around the world featured something happy instead of uh, the horrors of war that so many had been so used to hearing. During World War II, uh, the United States, again, developed a similar program in which they developed uh, an extensive sports program to entertain soldiers. Uh, the GI sports program in Europe was developed uh, around 1945 to entertain American soldiers serving occupation duty throughout Europe. Um, there were three and a half million American soldiers still stationed in Europe after the war, and the program offered intramural type competitions in just about every sport you can think of. Uh, baseball, football, track and field, swimming, and wrestling. And this program tells you a little bit about uh, those sports. We have in our collection at the Military Museum a robe that was worn by wrestler Alan Crabtree when he participated in the European theater wrestling program. Um, Alan Crabtree was a former Penn State wrestler. He graduated in 1943 and entered the Army after the war. Um, he attended armored officers training and became a specialized tank instructor. At the end of February 1945, uh, Allen was sent to Europe hoping to train Americans how to operate the M24 tank. Um, unfortunately, he got there before the tanks did and uh, the war ended. The mainland invasion of Japan was canceled after we dropped the atomic bombs in Japan and Crabtree remained in Europe as part of the occupation and got involved in the wrestling program. So the, the robe that you see here, it's made out of purple corduroy. It has a matching belt. And uh, interestingly enough, everyone on the wrestling team shared this one robe. So, uh, it was very, very well worn by the end of the war. Um, Crabtree was the team captain and they traveled throughout Europe wrestling. And in 1946, he fought the 158 pound weight class and won the theater service competition. He, along with the other first and second place winners of that competition went on to form an elite American team that competed against French, Belgian and Dutch national champions. You can see him there. I believe he is the man in the center. Um, in 1940s, the fall of 1946, uh, Allen returned home where he remained in the US Army Reserves and achieved the rank of major. So that's what we've got here from the Military Museum. Wow. So Jen, uh, since it was hard to see the, the robe, was USA embroidered on it to it, or is it painted, or? Yes, it's uh, very crudely embroidered on the back of the robe. I apologize, my pictures weren't super great oh, that's there. Okay. Well, a, a <clears throat> multi-person robe <laughs> from uh, the US Army. Thank you for that uh, most interesting presentation, sports across two wars in the military. Thank you, Jen. So uh, next um, up, we have uh, Joshua Fox from the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum. Uh, so we've been seeing your, your little uh, 
a piece of wood there, Josh. And also, uh, it looks like you may be wearing um, one of your favorite team's um, hats tonight. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks for the setup. I just say that railroad is not the only industry that has um, baseball related name teams. Uh, it might be a little hard to see, but this is for the Williamsport cross cutters, as in people who use cross cut saws minor league team. And if you see uh, this mascot of theirs has a log over one shoulder and a bat over another. And I will tell you how those logs become bats. Let me just get my screen up. So I'm talking about our baseball bat blank. Um, see the session number there. Uh, this bat was uh, in the process of becoming a Louisville slugger, but as you can see, it did not make it all the way. So this bat blank was um, milled from a piece of ash wood uh, in the late 80s and went to Latimer Norton Mill in Galton, Pennsylvania. Northern uh, tier of Pennsylvania, the southern tier of New York, has long been uh, the go-to source for ash wood that has been popular for making Major League Baseball bats. So much so that Hillerich and Bradsbury of Kentucky, who make the Louisville Sluggers, purchased the Latimer and Norton Mills in 1955 so that they would have their own steady supply of ash wood from that good Pennsylvania ash wood. By 2008, the firm Hillerich and Bursley owned 7,500 uh, 7, acres of timberland in Pennsylvania and New York just to bake Louisville sluggers. So what is a billet? Now, what I've showed you what we have is a bat blank, but a billet is a wood cylinder that's basically a blank canvas for a baseball bat. And the typical billet for sluggers, Louisville sluggers, three inches round, 37 inches long. And per their website, 5,000 to 8,000 billets are shipped per batch and 1.8 million bats are made each year. You see a picture of billets there. It's from the Akeley, Pennsylvania, Radimer and Norton Mill uh, from a newspaper article in 2018. So that, cylinder, that billet, is what would be made at the Radabur and Norton Mills, then sent down to Kentucky to be turned into baseball bats. Now, I just told you what a billet is, but what is not a billet anymore, at least here in America? Thanks to the Third Amendment, a billet cannot refer to a private home required to house or billet a soldier. Doesn't have too much to deal with lumber, but I figure when you get a chance to work in the Third Amendment, you might as well take that opportunity to work in the Third Amendment. Now, the rise of ash bats. Early in the dead ball era of baseball, so in the early days of professional baseball, hickory was the preferred wood. Bats back then were more club-like, uh, and the heavier wood of hickory uh, was more lent itself to those more club-like bats. And then when they moved to the live ball era, starting around the 1920s, the lighter wood of ash became more popular as batters started swinging for the fences, trying to knock the ball out of the park. And by the 1930s, ash is the predominant wood for bats in professional baseball, which is about the time that the Louisville Sluggers started to become um, come up to Pennsylvania for the wood. And the reason why Northern PA, Southern New York was very popular is because it's kind of that Goldilocks zone for ash trees, at least as far as baseball bats are concerned. Ash that grows further south tends to grow too fast. And ash that's more Northern is, tends to grow more slowly which changes the characteristics, the density of the, the tree. So that Northern PA, Southern New York found to be kind of the sweet spot made for the desirable bats. By the 1970s, there were 11 of the Latimer, uh, 
Burmer and Norton Mills that produced 6 million ash billets a year, again, just to become Louisville sluggers. That's not including any other back company. I have a picture of a couple of CCC uh, camp baseball activities from our collection, uh, just because I needed something to illustrate Pennsylvania bats at this time. So I figured I might as well throw these in for a little exposure as well. But so by the end of the 20th century or nearing at the end of the 20th century, Ash was a pop, the most popular bat for Major League Baseball for about a good 50, 60 years of dominance. Now, fall of Ash bats, there are a couple reasons why Ash is no longer as popular. First of all, is the emerald ash borer. This little bug at first appeared in the United States in 2002, and then in Pennsylvania, it was first spotted in 2007. Basically, it's an invasive species that will bore in uh, and lay its eggs in the bark of ash trees, which will then feed on the bark of these ash and essentially will kill ash trees. Uh, DCNR, the People who run the state forests and parks in Pennsylvania estimate that our ash population has declined by 12%. And this declining quantity and quality has really hit the uh, bat market. Um, the mills quoted in our article I read were saying that they just really can't get, they used to mill 40, 50 year old trees. Now they got to rush to mill trees that might only be half that age before they get killed off by the ash borer. But not all is lost because we have had efforts to introduce three types of non-stinging Asian wasps, which don't harm the trees, but they go after the ash borer. And they've seen positive efforts in combining the ash borer. So remember, we got to work together to smash out the ash borer. Also leading to the fall of ash bats were the rise of maple bats. Maple bats started gaining popularity in Major League Baseball in the mid to late 90s, but really took off in 2001, early 2000s, because Barry Bonds and Albert Pujols both had record setting years in 2001 using maple bats. Bonds uh, hit the single season home run record, and Pujols set the, or got the NL Rookie of the Year and the NL rookie record of 130 RBIs. Again, using maple bats. So because they had such success, other players really started to turn to maple bats, uh, especially players younger than them who were coming up behind them. So as of 2018, it's estimated that 75 to 80% of MLB players use maple compared to 10 to 15% birch, which was the second most popular word, and then ash had fallen all the way down to 10% of the bats used. And the people, the holdouts who still use ash bats, they tended to be the older players. The Larimer at um, Norton Mill at Gilton, uh, sorry, from, went down from 11 mills to just the two and Akeley and Gilton left. And the Akeley Mill went from producing 50,000 ash billets in 2010, down to only 10,000 in 2018. But not all is lost, because good news, maple and birch trees grow in Pennsylvania too. As of 2017, there were at least 10 baseball bat manufacturers in Pennsylvania, not all of them from Major League too. My little wood bat here is made by Coopersburg Sports, it's in Pennsylvania company in Coopersburg, Pennsylvania. So bats come in both big and small from the Commonwealth. The Gelton Mill had switched to maple and birch uh, to make their billets. It's a recent picture of logs outside of the Gelton Mill waiting to be turned into billets. And according to batdigest.com, two of the top five brands used on opening day last year were made by Pennsylvania companies, number two being Victus in King of Prussia, and number five is Chamber in East Norrington. The uh, picture down there is from a bat being made, literally turned, because you turn the bat, get it? Eh, I'm hilarious. 
but turned into um, the billet turned into a bat at the BW Bat, which is Brookville Wood Products uh, in Brookville, Pennsylvania. And they actually tied for seven, number 17 on that same list. So they are also very representative in Major League Baseball. So despite the decline and the struggles of the once mighty and popular ash bat, Pennsylvania is still a major producer of wood and bats for major league and amateur baseball. And you can find it all at the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum, or at least the bat blank, blank is on display. And since I threw a lot of, you know, uh, statistics, here's where I got them from. So I'm not just making them up. Once again, <laughs> the bat blank. Thank you. Gosh, uh, Josh, uh, thank you. Uh, who, who knew? I guess we need um, another uh, per, uh, player who breaks home run records with an ash bat, and then maybe the uh, ash will reign uh, king once again. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, coming up next is uh, our very own uh, Landis Valley Museum and uh, Jennifer Royer. So Jen, take it away. Good evening. While at Lehigh University, Henry Land is boxed, fenced, played on the freshman football team and was on the university's tug of war team. Henry's interest in baseball may have started when he was at college where he also played center field on the baseball team. This may have been when he developed an interest in collecting a variety of baseball artifacts that eventually make up a part of what is known today as the original Landis Brothers collection. This is a Scheib Pine baseball bat made in Philadelphia in 1910. Benjamin Franklin Scheib never played baseball due to a steel brace on his leg from a childhood accident. However, he was known as the Edison of the sport. Following the Civil War, he founded the John D. Scheib Company with his brother, producing 1.3 million baseballs and 100,000 bats per year. Scheib is also known for inventing the court-centered baseball, being a team owner in Philadelphia, and building the first steel and concrete stadium. Many of us remember buying Topps baseball cards with our stick of gum. However, that is not how baseball card collecting started. Beginning in the 1870s, it was originally part of a corporate marketing strategy to sell tobacco products. You would see a baseball card with your cigarettes. All of these cards are from the early 1900s. On the left is, is the cigarette card of Jack Quinn, who pitched for eight, eight teams in 23 seasons. He was one of the last pitchers in baseball permitted to throw the spitball. He was grandfathered in along with 16 others who were reliant on the pitch when it was banned in 1920. Next to Jack Quinn is Michael Mitchell, who was an outfielder from 1907 to 1914. As a rookie, Mitchell led the National League in outfield assists with 39. This set a record that was not broken until, the ninth, until 1930. In 1910, the tobacco companies branched out from the production of trading cards and created baseball buttons. As with the cards, they were given away free as premiums with packs of cigarettes. On the top left is Tommy Leaf, who was an outfielder and third baseman from 1898 to 1918. He played on the Pittsburgh Pirates and won the first Modern World Series in 1903 with the Pirates, hitting four triples to set a record that still stands. Next to Tommy Leach is John Warha, who played eight seasons from 1908 to 1915 for the New York Yankees. Warhop's claim to fame he gave up Babe Ruth's first career home run on May 6, 1915, when Ruth was on the Boston Red Sox. On the bottom left is Charles Albert Chief Bender, who was a pitcher from 1903 to 1925. In 1911, as a member of the Philadelphia Athletics, he tied a record 
by pitching three complete games in a single World Series. Next to Chief Bender is Carl Merkel, who was the first baseman from 1907 to 1926. He was best known for a base running mistake where he missed touching second base that gave him the nickname Bonehead. Miniature flannel blankets and rugs were also packaged with tobacco products. They were often sewn together to form pillows and bedspreads. Some of the rugs were used as placemats or even inside dollhouses. This piece is known as a B18 and is a colorful square flannel. The player pictured is Eddie Foster, who spent eight of his 13 years in the majors playing third and second base for the Washington Senators. In 1912 and 1914 through 1916, he played in every one of the 154 games, twice leading the league in at-bats. Tobacco companies were not the only companies that used baseball as an advertising source. During the late 1880s, baseball currencies were produced as a form of advertising for local merchants. They were known as currencies today to the, due to the fact that they resembled paper money and that the advertisements often offer consumers a discount on purchases made at retail shops. With this currency, you receive a 10% discount on purchases over $5. Depicted on the back is the St. Louis Browns. In 1887, they won their third of four consecutive league titles and played in four World Series. Finally, my favorite baseball artifact in the Landis Valley collection is a 1927 World Series ushers tag. Gus Miller was the chief usher at Ford's Field and he was responsible for section 176. Miller and this tag were, were at Ford's Field, Field during games one and two of the 1927 World Series when the New York Yankees with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, known as Murderer's Row, swept the Pittsburgh Pirates in four games. This was the first sweep of a National League team by an American League team. Hopefully, even all you Yankee haters out there can appreciate the uniqueness of this piece and the Landis Valley's other baseball artifacts. Thank you. Wow, Jen. Well, it looks like you're wearing um, a cap with a team that uh, you have something to say about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm born in, and raised in New York, so that's where my heart is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll let that. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. That was uh, really wonderful. Um, an amazing array of uh, pieces. So last tonight, but certainly not uh, least from the Anthracite uh, Heritage Museum is uh, John Fielding. Go ahead. Thank you. Hey, so tonight uh, I'm going to talk about uh, an International Ladies Garment Workers Union Bowling League trophy in the collection of the Anthracite Heritage Museum. Now, bowling is a sport that develops camaraderie and, and lasting friendships amongst teammates. The relationships that are established, um, <clears throat> I don't know what happened there. Uh, so bowling is a, a sport that develops camaraderie and lasting friendships amongst teammates. And the relationships that are established through bowling often act as a support network, giving strength uh, to the individual through the group. So the story of the trophy at, highlighted here in the center um, and its team captain, Vernon Mayhew, emphasizes team building skills that value camaraderie and mentorship. The first ILGWU bowling league in Luzerne County, PA, dates to at least 1958 in Hazleton, PA. The Hazleton ILGWU League was sponsored by their local 225 and originally had 20 teams and 100 players in its first year, so it was pretty popular. By the early 1960s, um, Wyoming Valley of Luzerne County had an ILGWU bowling league centered around Pittston and Wilkes-Barre. Now, declining union membership from the 1980s into the 1990s saw the league's decline and the league's final season was in the spring of 2001. 
This bowling trophy in the center was donated to the Anthracite Heritage Museum in 2005 by Unite Here, successors to the ILGWU, and is from the 1983-84 ILGWU League Bowling Championship. The bowling trophy was the ILGWU's Tri-District Center's championship trophy. The Tri-District Center was a uh, healthcare facility that was actually established by the International Ladies Garment Workers Union to provide um, medical coverage for its members. So the Tri-District uh, team was a part of the All Women's ILGWU League, which played at Stanton Lanes in Wilkes-Barre, PA. The team was established in 1981 and played through the spring 1989 season. From the winter 81-82 season to the spring 1985 season, team captain Verna Mayhew led the team to two league championships. The first in the 83-84 season, which this trophy represents, and the second in the spring 1985 season, posting records of 44 wins to 24 losses in both of those championship seasons. So she did pretty well leading the team in those seasons. And uh, I just go back for a second here. We have on the, the, the left side of the trophy, uh, the final standing of that year, 1983-84. So you can see that they were really one game uh, above the next group called Lori Charles. And then on the right, there's a, a listing, a uh, newspaper listing of all the other leagues that were in the Wyoming Valley. So you can see bowling was, and, and still is very popular in uh, Northeastern Pennsylvania today. So Verna Mayhew, who's highlighted here uh, in the red circle uh, in this newspaper clipping, uh, this is from 1968, Vernon Mayhew was a 30-year ILGWU member, as well as a board officer. She was a longtime uh, team member of the ILGWU's traveling bowling team, in addition to being on the tri-district uh, team. Verna was born in Huntington, PA, June 24, 1923. Verna and her two siblings were raised by uh, their single mother, and eventually Verna, uh, as she got older, got a job working for the G.C. Murphy Company, in the 1940s to help support her family. And after World War II, she married Charles Eugene Mayhew, a Marine corporal. The couple had two sons. However, the couple separated in the 1950s and Verna moved across the state to Kingston, PA with her children. She grew more active during this time in the ILGWU and eventually in 1968 became a union counselor, which is what this um, article is about. So her job as a, as a union counselor was kind of to, uh, to mentor and uh, kind of guide along younger uh, members of the union. So, <clears throat> however, in the early 1970s, her life was kind of turned upside down uh, for a little bit. And there were some problems with her son. Uh, he was charged with a few crimes and Verna was also charged with a, tr a crime trying to cover up one of her son's crimes. And it's highly unlikely, though, that she ever served any time for her crime. I believe she was acquitted. So after these incidents, though, she became even more involved with ILGWU's bowling leagues, and uh, perhaps as a distraction from her troubles. And once again, though, to mentor some of the younger union members who were often younger mothers. So Verna participated in various ILGWU teams in the mid 70s to 1981, when she became the captain of the ILGWU's Tri-District Center team. And once again, here's the trophy on the, the right. So she led the team to, uh, in addition to leading the team to two winning championships, she also led the team to a 300 to 196 record from 1981 to 1985. Mm -hmm. And the Tri-District Center team played in total 1,000 games in its 10-year history, winning 553 games and losing 463 for a 544 winning percentage. In 1983, uh, 84, the championship team members consisted of team captain, Verna Mayhew, uh, M. Devitt, D. Zlotnicki, Jackie Vesick, Andrea Dicton, Roberta Grish, and D. Peters. Now, Mayhew, Vesic, and Grish were often uh, weekly league leaders within the league, 
with one or more of them uh, consistently bowling 500 or, or better each week. And what, what I mean by that 500 or better is that that was their total score for the three games that they played every week. And that concludes my presentation. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Josh. So uh, we have an interesting array of sports uh, represented by a unique array of uh, museums. Uh, baseball seems to be in the majority, but we also have uh, boxing and uh, bowling. Before um, we go to the poll, I wanted to see if we have any questions for our panelists uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, Joshua, I have a question for you is that uh, talking about the shift in wood uh, from ash to maple, is uh, Louisville slugger um, ash or maple is the type of wood uh, what makes a Louisville slugger or is it just um, is it just a, a name? Not that so it really got started in ash um, and we're, the first Louisville sluggers were ash. Uh, back in the late 1800s. And from what I understand, uh, Louisville sluggers are still probably the largest producers of ash bats. Um, they, they do still operate, you know, the, the Latimer mills up here. Um, but just because of the decline ash bats, the demand has seen such a decline, not only in the, the hardness of getting the wood because of the emerald ash borers, but just the decline in the demand for major league players that they do make other types of wood bats, but they still do make ash, yes. Okay, great. Um, and this is for uh, Chris O'Brien at Railroad. Uh, do you by chance know where uh, Penmar Park was located in Philadelphia? I do. Um, it was actually located in West Philadelphia, and it was located on 44th and Parkside, and it was also known as the 44th and Parkside Ballpark. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, fantastic. Uh, before we go to the poll, for those of you who have access to uh, uh, our uh, chat feature is that there are some links for information on uh, Pennsylvania Historian Museum Commission in that uh, hopefully many of you are aware that um, all of our museums represented here tonight are going to be reopening to the public on Friday, um, April 30th for limited hours uh, for the first uh, for May and June. Uh, and Saturday, or Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, links are being provided in the chat that will go uh, to the welcome back page on the PHMC website, which will give you specific information on uh, the hours and all of the different uh, museums that we have at PHMC. So um, let me pull up the poll. Uh, and uh, as a reminder, we have the ILGW uh, Tridistic Bowling Trophy from Anthracite. We have a variety of material, bats, cards, buttons, a piece of flannel and usher tag from Landis Valley, the blanks from, bat blanks from Lumber, the uh, multiple use of the boxing robe and the inter-allied games ribbon, and then the, uh, uh, team uniform from Pennsylvania Railroad. So I'm going to launch the poll. Uh, go ahead and please select <clears throat> the museum or the artifact that you were most connected with. And then also while we're doing that again, um, if you go to the chat, you'll see a link to the uh, information that uh, is being listed on the PHMC website for our April 30th opening. And let's see, 
It looks like some of you are still thinking. Um, we do have um, a comment to our panelists that baseball bats are made of maple, hickory, ash, and then also um, we have a, a different ingredient here, a wood, a uh, bamboo. So it looks like most everyone has voted. I'm going to uh, end the poll. And it does look like we have a uh, winner tonight. I'm pleased to share with all of you coming in first place, uh, Mr. Christopher O'Brien from Pennsylvania Railroad Museum and your uniform. All right. Three cheers for uh, <laughs> the Railroad, Railroad Museum. Um, and uh, Jen uh, Royer, I'll say, let you know that uh, Landis Valley came in a close second. So uh, Chris, uh, I wish I could show you the championship uh, belt, but place it here and imagine all the sparkle and bling. And uh, later this year, uh, you and your institution will have the uh, wonderful pleasure of being able to host one of these um, extravaganzas. So we uh, thank you um, panelists for joining us and sharing uh, baseball and all of these wonderful artifacts uh, with us. So on behalf of uh, myself, my colleagues, PHMC, thank you for uh, joining us and we hope to see you uh, in May for another collections uh, showcase. So, Good night.